The Continued Story of Terran, the Assistant Pig Keeper. I'm glad you stayed to listen. Now sit round, as Papa Bear reads a story. Chapter 3. A Dawn. At first light, the warriors made ready to depart. Terran hurriedly saddled the gray, silver-made Melonmoss, colt of Gwydion's own steed, Melangar. Gurgi, miserable as a wet owl at being left behind, helped load the saddlebags. Dalbin had changed his mind about not seeing anyone, and stood silent and thoughtful in the cottage doorway, with Elenry beside him. "'I'm not speaking to you,' she cried to Terran. "'The way you acted, that's like asking someone to a feast, then making them wash the dishes. But farewell, anyway. That,' she added, "'does not count as speaking.'" Gwydion, leading the horseman, moved through the swirling mist. Terran rose in his saddle, turned, and waved proudly. The white cottage and the three figures grew smaller. Field and orchard fell away as Melonlass cantered into the trees. The forest closed behind Terran and he could see Cairdalban no more. With a whinny of alarm, Melonlass sun suddenly reared. As Eladir had ridden up behind Terran, his steed had reached out her long neck and given the stallion a spiteful nip. Terran clutched at the reins and nearly fell. Keep your distance from Islamok, said Eladir with a raw laugh. She bites. We are much alike, Islamok and I. Terran was about to reply angrily when Adon, who had seen what happened, drew his bay mare to Eladir's side. You are right, son of Pan Lecur, Adon said. Your horse carries a difficult burden, and so do you. What burden do I carry? cried Eladir, bristling. Last night I dreamed of us all. Adon said thoughtfully, fingering the iron clasp at his throat. You I saw with a black beast on your shoulders. Beware, Eladir, lest it swallow you up. He added, the gentleness of his tone softening the harshness of his counsel. Spare me from pig boys and dreamers, Eladir retorted with a shout, er, with a shout, urged Islamok further up the column. And I, Terran asked, what did you dream of, tell of me? You, answered Adon after a moment's hesitation, you were filled with grief. "'What cause have I to grieve?' asked Terran, surprised. "'I am proud to serve Lord Gwydion, and there is a chance to win much honor, more than by washing pigs and weeding gardens.' "'I have marched in many a battle host,' Adon answered quietly. "'But I have also planted seeds and reaped the harvest with my own hands, and I have learned there is greater honor in a field well plowed than in a field steeped in blood.' The column had begun to move war more rapidly, and they quickened the steeds' gates. Adon rode easily and skillfully, head high, an open smile on his face. He seemed to be drinking in the sights and the sounds of the morning, while Fluter, Dolly, and Call kept pace with Gwydion, and Eladir followed suddenly behind King Morgan's troop. Terran kept to Adon's side along the leaf-strewn path. As they spoke together to ease the rigors of their journey, Terran soon realized there was little Adon had not seen or done. He had sailed far beyond the Isle of Mona, even to the northern sea. He had worked at the potter's wheel, cast nets with the fisherfolk, woven cloth at the looms of the cottages, and, like Terran, labored over the glowing forge. Of forest lore he had studied deeply, and Terran listened in wonder as Adon told the ways and natures of wooden creatures, of bold badgers and cautious dormice, and geese winging under the moon. There is much to be known said Adon, and above all to be loved, be it the turn of the seasons, or the shape of a river petal. Indeed, the more we find to love, the more we add to the measure of our hearts. Adon's face was bright in the early rays of the sun, but a trace of longing had come into his voice. When Terran asked him what was amiss, he did not answer immediately, as though he wished to hold his own thoughts. "'My heart will be lighter when our task is done,' Adon said at last. Arainlan, my betrothed, waits for me in the northern domains, and the sooner Aron's cauldron is destroyed, the sooner I may return to her. By day's end, they had become fast friends. At nightfall, when Terran rejoined Gwydion and his companions, Adon camped with them. They had already crossed Great Avern, and were well on their way to the borders of King Smoit's realm. Gwydion was satisfied with their progress, though he warned them the most difficult and dangerous portion of their journey was to come. All were in good spirits, save Doli, who hated riding horseback, and gruffly declared, declared he could go faster afoot. As the companions rested in a protected grove, Fluter offered his harp to Adon and urged him to play. Adon, sitting comfortably with his back against the tree, put the instrument to his shoulder. For a moment, 
He was thoughtful, his head bowed. Then his hands gently touched the strings. The voice of the harp and Adon's voice twined one with the other in harmonies Terran never before had heard. The tall man's face was raised towards the stars, and his gray eyes seemed to be far beyond them. The forest had fallen silent. The night sounds were stilled. The song of Adon was not of a warrior's lay, but one of peacefulness and deep joy. And as Terran listened, its echoes rang again and again in his heart. He longed for the music to continue, but Adon stopped almost abruptly, and with a grave smile handed the harp back to Fluter. The companions wrapped themselves in their cloaks and slept. Elidir remained aloof from them, stretched on the gro ground at the hooves of his roan. Terran, his head pillowed on his saddle, his hand on his new sword, was impatient for dawn and eager to resume the journey. Yet as he dropped into slumber, he recalled a dawn's dream and felt a shadow like the flutter of a dark wind. The next day, the companions crossed the river Yistrad and began bearing northward. With much loud grumbling at being kept from the quest, King Smoit obeyed Gwydion and turned away from the column, riding toward Ker Kadarn to ready his warriors. Later, the pace of the column slowed as the pleasant meadows wrinkled into hills. Shortly after midday, the horsemen entered the forest of Idras. Here, the brown withered grasses were sharp as thorns. Once familiar cloaks and alders appeared strange to Terran. Their dead leaves clung to the tangled branches, and the black trunks jutted like jarred bones. At length, the forest broke away to reveal sheer faces of jagged cliffs. Quidian signaled the company forward. Terran's throat tightened. For a cold instant, he shrank from urging Malamus up the tiny slope. He knew, without a word from Gwydion, that the dark gate of Anuvin was not far distant. Narrow trails rising above deep gorges now forced the company to go in single file. Terran, Adon, and Eladir had been jogging at the end of the column, but Eladir kicked his heels against Islamok's flanks and thrust his way past Terran. Your place is at the rear, pig boy, he called. And your place is where you earn it, cried Terran, giving Melonless rein to strive ahead. The horses jostled, the riders struggled knee against knee. Islamok reared and neighed wildly. With his free hand, Eladir seized the bridle of Melonless to force the stallion back. Terran tried to turn his mount's head, but Melonless, in a shower of pebbles, slipped from the trail to the steep slope. Terran flung out of the saddle, clutched at the rocks to break his fall. Melonless, more sure-footed than his master, regained his balance on a ledge below the trail. Terran sprawled flat against the stones, tried vainly to clamber back up to the path. Adon dismounted instantly and ran to the edge of the slope and attempted to grasp Terran's hand. Eladir too dismounted. He brushed Adon aside, leaped down, seized Terran under the arms. With a powerful heave, he tossed Terran like a sack of meal to the safety of the trail. Picking his way towards Melonless, Eladir put his shoulder beneath the saddle girth and strained mightily. With all his strength, little by little, he raised Melonless until the stallion was able to clamber from the ledge. You fool! Terran threw back at Eladir, racing to Melonless and anxiously examining the steed. Has your pride crowded all the wits out of your head? Melonless, he saw with relief, was unharmed. Despite himself, he glanced at Eladir in amazement and not without a certain admiration. I have... Never seen such a feat of strength, Terran admitted. Eladir, for the first time, seemed confused and frightened. I did not mean for you to fall, he began. Then he threw back his head and, with a mocking smile, added, My concern is for your steed, not your skin. I, too, admire your strength, Eladir, Adon said sharply, but it is to your shame it is proved thus. The black beast rides in the saddle with you. I see it even now. One of Morgant's warriors, hearing the clamor, had given the alarm. A moment later, Quidian, followed by King Morgant, strode back along the trail. Behind them hurried the agitated fluter and the dwarf. "'Your pig boy had no better sense than to force his way past me,' Eladir said to Quidian. "'Had I not pulled him and his steed back?' "'Is this true?' Quidian asked, glancing at Terran in his torn clothing. Terran, about to answer, shut his lips tightly and nodded his head. He saw the look of surprise on Eladir's angry face. "'We have no lives to waste,' Gwydion said. "'Yet you have risked two. I cannot spare a man, or I would send you back to Caradalvin this instant. But I shall, if this happens again, and you too, Eladir, or any of this company.' King Morgant stepped forward. "'This proves what I had feared, Lord Gwydion. 
our way is difficult, even burdened with the cauldron. Even unburdened with the cauldron. Once we gain it, I urge you again not to return to Caerdalvin. It would be wiser to take the cauldron north into my realm. I think, too, Morgan continued, that a number of my own warriors should be dispatched to guard our retreat. In exchange, I offer these three, he said, gesturing toward Terran, Adon, and Eladir, a place among my horsemen when I attack. If I read their faces well, they would prefer it to waiting in reserve. Yes, cried Terran, gripping his sword. Let us join the attack, Gwydion shook his head. The plan shall be as I said it. Mount quickly. We have already lost much time. King Morgan's eyes flickered. It shall be as you command, Lord Quidian. What happened? whispered Fluter to Terran. Don't tell me Eladir wasn't to blame for something. He's a troublemaker. I can see it. I can't imagine what Quidian was thinking of when he brought him along. The blame is as much mine, said Terran. I behaved no better than he did. I should have held my tongue with Eladir, he added. That's not easy to do. Yes, the bard sighed, glancing at his harp. I have a rather similar difficulty. Throughout the next day, the company went with greatest caution, for birds of Gwythaint, Aron's fearsome messengers, were now seen against the clouds. Shortly before dusk, the trail led downward towards a shallow basin set with scrub and pines. There, Gwydion halted. Ahead rose the baleful crags of Dark Gate, its twin slopes blazing crimson in the dying sun. Thus far, the company had encountered no cauldron-born. Terran deemed this lucky, but Gwydion frowned uneasily. I fear the cauldron-born more when they cannot be seen, Gwydion said after calling the warriors around him. I would almost believe they had deserted Anuvan, but Dolly brings me news I wish I might spare you. Had me turn invisible and run ahead, that's what he did, Dolly furiously muttered to Terran. When we go into Anuvan, I'll have to do it again. Humph, <laughs> my ears already feel like a swarm of bees. Take heed, all of you, Gwydion went on. The huntsmen of Anuvan are abroad. I have faced the cauldron-born, Terran boldly cried. These warriors can be no more than terrible. Do you believe so? Gwydion replied with a grim smile. I dread them as much. They are ruthless, just as much as the cauldron-born. Their strength even greater. They go afoot, yet they are swift, with much endurance. Fatigue, hunger, and thirst mean little to them. The cauldron-born are deathless, Terran said. If these are mortal men, they can be slain. They are mortal, Gwydion answered, though I scorn to call them men. They are the basest of warriors who have betrayed their comrades, murderers who have killed for the joy of it. To indulge their own cruelty, they have willingly chosen Alarn's realm, and have sworn allegiance to him, with a blood oath even they cannot break. Yes, Gwydion added, they can be slain, but Aron has forged them into a brotherhood of killers and give them a terrible power. They rove in small bands, and within these companies the death of one man only adds to the strength of all the rest. Shun them. Gwydion warned, do not give battle, if it is possible to avoid it, for the more you strike down, the more the others gain in strength. Even as their number dwindles, their power grows. Conceal yourself now, he ordered, and sleep. Our attack must begin tonight. Relentless. Terran could barely force himself to close his eyes, restlessly. When he did, it was in light, un uneasy slumber. He woke with a start, groping for his sword. Adon, already awake, cautioned him to silence. The moon rode high, cold and glittering. The warriors of King Morgan's trail moved like shadows. There was a faint jingle of harness, the whisper of a blade drawn from its sheath. Dolly, having turned himself invisible, had departed toward Dark Gate. Terran found the bard strapping his beloved harp more securely to his shoulders. I doubt I'll really need it, Fluter admitted. On the other hand, you never know what you'll be called on to do. A flame is always prepared. Beside him, Call had just donned a close-fitting conical helmet. The sight of the stout-hearted stout old warrior, and the cap hardly seeming enough to protect his bald head, filled Terran suddenly with sadness. He threw his arms around Call and wished him good fortune. "'Well, my boy,' said Call, winking, "'never fear, we'll be back before you know it. Then off to care Dolben, and the task is done.' King Morgant, cloaked heavily in black, halted at Terran's side. It would have done me honor to count you among my men, he said. Gwydion has told me a little of you, and I have seen you for myself. I am a warrior, and I recognize good metal. 
This was the first time Morgant had ever spoken directly to him, and Terran was so taken aback with surprise and pleasure that he could not even stammer out a response before the war leader strode away on his horse. Terran caught sight of Gwydion astride Melangar and ran to him. Let me go with you, he pleaded again. If I was man enough to sit with you in council and to come this far, I am man enough to ride with your warriors. Do you love danger this much? asked Gwydion. Before you are a man, he added gently, you will learn to hate it. Yes, and fear it too, even as I do. He reached down and clasped Terran's hand. Keep a bold heart. Your courage will be tested enough. Disappointed, Terran turned away. The riders vanished beneath the trees, and the grove seemed empty and desolate. Malinlas, tethered among the other steeds, whinnied plaintively. This night will be long, Adon said, looking intently past the shadows at the brooding heights of Darkgate. You, Terran, shall stand first watch, Eladir, second, until the moon is down. So you shall have more time for dreaming, Eladir said with a scornful laugh. You will find no quarrel with my dreams tonight, replied Adon good-naturedly, for I will share the watch with both of you. Sleep, Eladir, he added, or if you will not sleep, at least keep silent. Eladir angrily wrapped himself in his cloak and threw himself on the ground near Islamak. The rowan wickered and bent her neck, nuzzling her master. The night was chill. Frost had begun to sparkle on the dry leaves, and a cloud trailed across the moon. Adon drew his sword and stepped to the edge of the trees. The white light caught his eyes, turning them brilliant as star sign. He was silent, head raised, alert as a wild creature of the forest. Do you think they've gone into Anuvan yet? Terran whispered. They should soon be there, Adon whispered. I wish Gwydion had taken we let us go with him, Terran said with a certain bitterness. Or with Morgant. Do not wish that, Adon said quickly. His face held a look of concern. Why not? asked Terran, puzzled. I would have been proud to follow Morgant. Next to Gwydion, he is the greatest warlord in Pridain. He is a brave and powerful man, Adon agreed. But I am uneasy for him. In my dream, the night before we left, warriors rode a slow circle around him, and Morgant's sword was broken and weeping blood. Perhaps there is no meaning in it? Terran suggested as much to reassure himself as Adon. Does it always happen that your dreams are always true? Adon smiled. There is truth in all things if you understand them well. You never told me what you dreamed of the others, Terran said, of Call or good old Dolly, or yourself for the matter of that. Adon did not reply, but turned again and looked toward Darkgate. Unsheathing his sword, Terran moved worriedly to the edge of the grove. Chapter 4 In the Shadow of Dark Gate The night passed heavily, and it was nearly time for Eladir's turn at guard when Terran heard a rustling in the shrub. He raised his head abruptly. The sound stopped. He was unsure now that he had really heard it. He held his breath and waited, poised and tense. Adon, whose ears were as keen as his eyes, had also noticed it and was at Terran's side in an instant. There was, it seemed to Terran, a flicker of light. A branch cracked nearby. With a shout, Terran swung up his blade and leaped toward it. A golden beam flashed in his eyes, and a squeal of indignation struck his ears. Put down that sword, Eleni cried. Every time I see it, you're waving it around or pointing it at somebody. Terran fell back dumbfounded. As he did, a dark figure bounded past Eladir, who sprang to his feet, his blade unsheathed and whistling through the air. Help, help! howled Gurji. Angry lord will harm Kurji's poor tender head with slashings and gashings. He scuttled halfway up a tall pine tree, and from the safety of his perch shook a fist at the astonished Eladir. Terran pulled Elidmi into the protection of the grove. Her hair was disheveled, her robe torn and mudstained. What have you done? he cried. Do you want us all killed? Put out that light. He seized the glowing spear and fumbled vainly with it. Oh, you'll never learn how to use my bauble. Elenwi said with impatience. She took back the golden ball, cupped it in her hand, and the light vanished. Adon, recognizing the girl, put his hand anxiously on her shoulder. Princess, princess, you should not have followed us. Of course she shouldn't, Terran put in angrily. She must return immediately. She's a foolish, scatterbrained. She is uncalled and unwanted here, said Elidir, striding up. He turned to Adon. For once, the pig boy shows sense. Send the little fool back to her pots. 
Terran spun around. Hold your tongue. I have swallowed your insults to me for the sake of our quest, but you will not speak ill of another. Adir's sword leaped up. Terran raised his own. Adon stepped between them and held out his hands. Enough! Enough! he ordered. Are you so eager to shed blood? Must I hear reproof from a pig boy? reported Eladir. Must I let a scullery maid cost me my head? Scullery maid? shrieked Eleni. Well, I can tell you. Gurji, meantime, had clambered cautiously from the tree and had loped over to stand behind Terran. And this, Eladir laughed bitterly, gesturing at Gurji. This thing. Is this the black beast that so alarmed you, dreamer? No, Eladir, it is not, murmured Adon, so almost sadly. This is Gurji, the warrior, Gurji boldly cried over Terran's shoulder. Yes, yes, clever, valiant Gurji, who joins Master to keep him from harmful hurtings. Be silent, Terran ordered. You've caused enough trouble. How did you reach us? Adon asked. You were on foot. Well, not really, Elmi said. At least not all the way. The horses didn't run off until a little while ago. What? cried Terran. You stole horses from Caradalbin and lost them? You know perfectly well they're our own horses, declared Elmi. The ones Gwydion gave us last year, and we didn't lose them. It was more as they lost us. We only stopped to let them drink, and the silly things galloped away. Frightened, I suppose. I think they didn't like being so close to Anuvin, though I'll tell you truthfully it doesn't bother me in the least. In any case, she concluded, you needn't worry about them. The last we saw, they were heading straight for Caradalbin. And so shall you be, Terran said. And so I shall not, cried Elemy. I thought about it a long time after you left, every bit as long as it took you to cross the fields, and I decided it doesn't matter what anybody says. Fair is fair. If you can be allowed on a quest, so can I. And there it is, as simple as that. And it was clever Gurji who found the way. Gurji put in proudly. Yes, yes, with whiffings and sniffings. Gurji does not let gentle princess go alone. Oh, no. Loyal Gurji does not leave friends behind. He added reproachfully to Terran. Since you have come this far, Adon said, you may await Gwydion. Although how we will deal with you two runaways may not be to your liking. Your journey, he added, smiling at the bedraggled princess, seems to have been more difficult than ours. Rest now and take refreshment. Yes, yes, Gurji cried, crunchings and munchings for brave, hungry Gurji. That's very kind and thoughtful of you, said Elenry with an admiring glance at Adon. Much more than you can expect from certain assistant pig keepers, anyways. Adon went to the stock of provisions, while Ed Eladir strode off to his guard post. Terran sat down wearily on a boulder, his sword across his knees. It's not that we're starving, Elenry said. Gurji did remember to bring along the wallet of food. Yes, and that was a gift from Gwydia, too, as he had every right to take it. It's certainly a magical wallet, she went on. It never seems to get empty. The food is really quite nourishing, I'm sure, and wonderful to have when you need it. But the truth of the matter is, it's rather tasteless. That's often the trouble with magical things. They're never quite what you'd expect. Oh, you're angry, aren't you? Eleni went on. I can always tell. You look as if you swallowed a wasp. If you had stopped to think of the danger... Terran replied, instead of rushing off without thinking about what you're doing. You're a fine one to talk, Terran of Caradalbin, said Elenry. Besides, I don't think you're as angry as all that, and not after what you said to Eladir. It was wonderful the way you were ready to smite him because of me. Not that you needed to, I could have taken care of him myself, and I didn't mean you weren't kind and thoughtful. You really are, it just doesn't always occur to you. For an assistant peakkeeper, you do amazingly well. Before Ellen we could finish, Eladir gave a shout of warning. A horse and rider plunged into the grove. It was Fluter. Behind him galloped Dolly's shaggy pony. Breathless, and with his yellow hair pointing in all directions, the bard flung himself from the steed and ran to Adon. Make ready to leave, <sighs> he cried. Take the weapons. Get the pack horses moving. We're going to Kerkadarn. He caught sight of Eleni. Great Beelin, what are you doing here? I'm tired of everyone being asking that, Eleni said. The cauldron, cried Terran. Did you seize it? Where are the others? Where's Dolly? Here. Where else? snapped a voice. In another instant, Dolly flickered into sight, astride what had seemed to be an empty saddle. He jumped heavily to the ground. Didn't even take time to make myself visible again. He clapped his hands to his head. Oh, my ears. 
Gwydion orders us to fall back immediately, the bard went on in great excitement. And he and Call are with Morgant. They'll catch us up if they can. If not, we are to rally at Kerkadarn. While Elidir and Adon hurriedly untethered the animals, Terran and the bard packed the store of weapons. Keep these, Pluter ordered, pressing a bow and quiver of arrows into Elendry's hands. And the rest of you, arm yourselves well. What happened? Terran asked fearfully. Did the plan fail? <laughs> the plan, Pluter asked. That was perfect. Couldn't have been better. Morgant and his men rode with us to the Dark Gate. Ah, that Morgant. What a warrior. Not a nerve in him. Cool as you please. You might have thought he was going to a feast. The bard shook his spiky head. And there we were, on the very threshold of Anuvan. Oh, you'll hear songs about that. Mark my words. Stop yammering, ordered Dully, hastening up with the agitated pack horses. Yes, the plan was fine, he cried angrily. It would have gone slick as butter. There was only one thing wrong. We wasted our time and Rick's risked our necks for nothing. Will one or the other of you make sense? Elony burst out. I don't care about songs or butter. Tell us straight out. Where is the cauldron? I don't know, said the bard. Nobody knows. You lost it? Elony gasped, clapping a hand to her mouth. No, oh, you pack of ninnies, great heroes. I knew I should have gone with you from the beginning. Dully looked as if he were about to explode. His ears trembled. He raised himself on tiptoe, his fists clench. Don't you understand? The cauldron is gone. Away. Not there. But that's not possible, Terran cried. Don't tell me what is or isn't possible, Dully snapped. I was there. I know what I saw. I know what I heard. I went in first, just as Gwydion ordered. I found the Hall of Warriors. No trouble. No guards, in fact. Aha, think I. This will be easier than whistling. I slipped in. I could have done it in full view, in broad daylight. And why? Because there was nothing to guard. There was the platform. The platform was empty. Aron had moved the cauldron, Tanner interrupted. There is a new hiding place. He's got to have it locked up somewhere else. Don't you think I have the wits I was born with? Dolly interrupted. That was the first thing that came into my head. So I set off again. I'd have searched Aron's own chamber if I'd had to. But I hadn't gotten six paces before I ran into a pair of Aron's guards. Or they ran into me, the clumsy oafs. Dolly muttered, rubbing a bruised eye. I went along with them a little way. By then, I'd heard enough. Must have happened a few days ago. How, or who, I don't know. Neither does Auron. You can imagine his rage. But whoever they were, they got there ahead of us. They did their work well. The cauldron is gone from Anuvan. But that's wonderful, said Elenry. Our task is done, and it costs us nothing more than a journey. Our task is far from done. Adon had finished loading one of the pack horses and had come to stand beside Terran. Elidir, too, had been listening closely. We've lost the glory of fighting for it, Terran said. But the important thing is that Aron has it no longer. It is not so easy, Adon warned. This is the stinging defeat for Aron, but he will do all in his power to regain the cauldron. But there is more. The cauldron is dangerous in itself, even out of Aron's grasp. What if it has fallen into other hands? Exactly what Fluter, that what Gwydion himself said, Fluter put in. The thing has somehow got to be found and destroyed without delay. Gwydion will plan a new search from Kerkadarn. It would seem our work has just begun. Mount your steeds, Adon ordered. We cannot overburden our pack animals. The princess, Elenry, and Gurji will have to share our own horses. Is the mock will bear only me, Eldir said. She has been trained so from a foal. I would expect that from a steed as yours, Terran said. Elenry can ride with me. And I shall take Gurji with me, on Luger, Adon said. Come now, quickly. Terran ran to Melanus, leaped astride, and pulled Elenry up behind him. Dole and the others hastened to mount. But as they did, savage cries burst from either side of them, and there was a sudden hiss of arrows. This concludes Chapter 4. Thank you for listening, and have a good day. You deserve it.